All right, the title is RIP, <laughs> Rest in Peace. Now, the world uses this term um, as something that it does not apply to. You can't tell a dead man to rest in peace. You think he's deciding whether or not he's resting in peace? If he's in heaven, he's at peace, but he ain't resting. He's praising God. If he's in hell, there can be no peace. And there he's not resting either. So the term doesn't mean anything for a dead person. It means something for you. Every night you want to do this, don't you? You want to rest in peace? You can. God can give you peace to rest with. It only applies to a Christian, though. Let's notice our verse. Here's our text. This text breaks down into three points real easily. Uh, but it's not that easy to preach. So I'm just going to attempt to do one-third of the verse. And we'll try another section of it at another date. But we'll, we'll try to get the first uh, point on this verse. Read the whole verse first. It's Psalms 4, verse 8. It's on the screen. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Here David says, I'm going to lay down in peace and take me asleep. But you want to bet? <laughs> You can't just de declare and decree that. I'm going to ask you this. Can you say that about tonight? Tonight, can you say? Or let's, let's pick a hard one. Um, Monday. Monday after all the bills come in. Or whatever rent day is. Can you say the night before that, I'm going to lay down and I'm going to give me a good night's sleep. <laughs> David, good. <laughs> And he's not just dreaming here. He's telling the truth. <laughs> look back at chapter 3. Here's how he can say that. Chapter 3, look at verse 1. Now, I don't know. Your Bible may or may not have the, the titles here. Some Bibles will give you the context of a chapter. And they'll say, this is where David was. This is who's writing. This is what the chapter is about. In this chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, it's a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. That was not a happy, good time. His son is stealing the kingdom from him in rebellion, and David is running for his life. So that's what this chapter is about. Let's see what happened. Verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5. I laid me down and slept. I awaked. For the Lord sustained me. What a time to figure something out. He figured something out. Right in the midst of running for his life. He said, you know what I found out? I can lay down and go to sleep. And I can wake up knowing that God took care of business for me. That's pretty good. A lot of people lay down and go to sleep. And they can't sleep because they're so worried about sustaining life or themselves or whatever it is that... Is haunting them. And we've all got things that haunt us. When you lay down, the devil will remind you of them. You could have not remembered one thing about it all day long. But the second your head hits that pillow, all of a sudden, here they come. <laughs> There's a way that God will take care of that. Uh, let's get to our passage. We're just going to cover this one little phrase. I will both lay me down in peace. So the peace is the part we're going to talk about first. Peace. Providing peace for his people is God's job. Matter of fact, it's part of his character. It's who he is. Um, and this comes through many ways. Let's notice the provision of peace. Peace is provided through obedience to God's word. If you start obeying what God said, you'll notice something. You start getting peace. Just in doing that. 2 Kings, look at 2 Kings 5, verse 13. 2 Kings 5, verse 13. 2 Kings 5, 13. Anybody know what this story is? 2 Kings 5, 13. Naaman, that's right. He was the leper. And this is how he's going to be healed. It's through a means that he wouldn't have prescribed himself. Verse 13. 
His servants came near and spake unto him, and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather, when he saith unto thee, Wash and be clean. You know, God's word tells us some simple things to do. The problem is most of us aren't willing to do the simple things. <laughs> the things that we know to do. Not these great, you know, it would be great if we could sit down and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to come up with the way that this problem works and it's going to just amaze all of, you know, Christendom and, you know. <laughs> I'm going to put together a chart that makes the Bible clear and nobody's going to ever doubt it again. Well, yeah, yeah, probably not. <laughs> that would be a great big thing. And everybody would love to do that. But there is, there is some things we can do. We can be thankful. Well, that sounds so mundane. But he says we're always to be thankful. We can pray without ceasing. That's a small thing. Here, Naaman, he wasn't going to get healed if he wasn't willing to do the simple thing. Go dip in the muddy river. <laughs> if you want healing, that's where it starts, doing the simple things. Now, let's look down at verse, uh, look at verse 19. He's finally healed. He goes back to the man and says, hey, look, you wouldn't let me do something mighty to get healed. Now, let me give you something extraordinary to prove I'm thankful. And the man of God says, no, don't need that. That's not what it's about, verse 19. And he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. You know what? If you just obey God, it doesn't require all of these great things. You're not going to spend a whole lot, and you're not going to produce something that you can be proud of. See, if Naaman had been able to give Elijah or Elisha, who is it here? If he had been able to give the prophet a <laughs> million dollars, then he would have felt good about himself. And you know what the other people would have thought? I'll never be able to be healed because I can't give that. <laughs> God's not worried about what you can give him. He's worried about you obeying him. Just the simple things. Don't overcomplicate it. Look at Job chapter 22. Job 22, verse 21. We're going to make three sub-points to our main point, and until we get to the very last point, I'm just going to keep you in the Old Testament so that we can keep this down to about four hours. Uh, he says, Job 22, verse 21, Acquaint now thyself with him, be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? get acquainted with God, you know what comes with it? Peace. Maybe you don't know enough about God. Well, there's one book that's going to tell you about him. Only one. There's other people that'll write books about him and they may or may not be right. You better get in the book he wrote. He'll tell you about him. He says, with that comes good and comes peace. Verse 22. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. That's a pathway to peace right there. Psalm chapter 85, Psalms 85 verse 8. Psalms 85 verse 8. It says, I will hear what the Lord, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. <laughs> Usually, when you're reading your Bible, you'll get some sort of instruction, you'll get some sort of uh, illumination, and that'd be great. A lot of times, you also, with it, will get a, this is the good thing for you, but be careful you don't run into this, because this will be bad for you. <laughs> that's what we just got right there. If you want peace, that's good, because guess what? God speaks peace to his people. Get in his word, and you'll find peace. But he says... Watch out, just because you found it once doesn't mean you can't get reprimanded. Let them not turn again to folly. <laughs> so there's always, with peace, also comes the warning, <clears throat> you could lose it. You could, uh, 
and we'll get more into it as we get into the to the end of the message but right now we'll just leave it there look at isaiah chapter 54 isaiah 54 verse 13 isaiah 54 verse 13 <clears throat> He says, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. I don't know that this really applies so much to anybody here. Maybe somebody that will watch it on YouTube. <laughs> when, when you have children, you know what? Those children can make your household peaceful or just the opposite of peace. Do you need peace from your children? The Bible says, teach them about the Lord. And that causes peace in the house. That's just a simple fact. He says, now this is talking about a time, doctrinally, when Jesus Christ will be on the earth in the millennium, and he will physically be teaching people. But the same is true also in your household. If you'll teach your children about Jesus Christ and about the Lord and about God and put that in their heart, it causes peace. That's what God's Word causes. And it'll cause them to be more peaceful than otherwise. Okay, so that's, uh, we find the provision of peace in obedience to God's Word. Not only that, we find it in obedience to God's law. Now that's a little more scary, His law. That is, do this and don't do that. His word may just be, rest in me, and, and that's good. There's nothing scary about that one. But his law usually says, don't you dare. <laughs> don't step over that line. <laughs> Leviticus 26, Leviticus 26, verse 3. Leviticus 26, verse 3. Usually God's law is identified with this humongous word, if. <laughs> the word I, F, if. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Okay, that's our job. That's the instruction. Here's what happens, verse 6. And I will give peace in the land. And ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. You'll be able to sleep at night. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. Now, of course, doctrinally, that's specifically talking to Israel. Well, you as an individual can apply it spiritually. In your life, you won't have to worry about issues that are going to come try to d devastate you. If you will adhere to God's laws and commandments then he'll take care of the rest of it. In Psalms 119, Psalms 119, verse 165. Psalms 119, verse 165. A lot of Christians need this verse right here. <laughs> I don't care what happens to you. You, you. you can either find a negative or a positive. <laughs> You know, some people, some people always see the glass as half empty. Here's what God says. God says you should be an optimist. You should see it as half full. Look at it. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know the most offended people in the world today are Christians. They're offended by how wicked the world... Hello, the devil is wicked. What do you think's going to be? <laughs> Don't get offended by that. Love God's law. You find yourself getting offended by something? Maybe you don't love the law of God enough. Go find some laws you can fall in love with that are from God. And you'll be worried about that more than you will about getting offended about your neighbor not doing right. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18 Isaiah 48 verse 18 Here's a lament Isaiah 48 18 Oh that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments 
Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Mm. God said when people refused to obey his commandments, they forsook peace, because that's what would have come from obeying the commandments. God's not some ogre up there. He put the rules in here for a reason, so you can have peace. <laughs> not only that, uh, it comes, finding um, peace comes from the things associated with the law, I'll say the provisions of the law. In Deuteronomy 30, look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. He says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Ask somebody sometime, do you love God? Most Christians would chime in on that one. Oh, yes, I do. Okay, that's step one. Do you know what step two is? Let's find it. He says, I've commanded thee this, this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways. Are you doing that? You're walking in his ways? Can you identify when it's his way and when it's no, not his way? Okay, so you'll know which one you're doing. Are you keeping his commandments? Do you know his commandments? Are you keeping them? <laughs> you know what his statutes are? You know the difference between commandments and statutes? How about his judgments? You know what those are? How do those differ from commandments and statutes? We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Just from one verse. But it's good because peace comes through it. That's what we get out of it. Not only that, uh, the provision of the house of God. Now, I know in the Old Testament he's talking about a literal place the temple or the tabernacle where God's presence would be. And a church is not the house of God like the Old Testament had. But it's similar. When Christians get together, each Christian has the Spirit of God, and you get a whole bunch of them together, and there's a big presence of the Spirit of God. I mean, that's just a fact. Where two or three are gathered, my name there, mine in the midst. Well, that's true. He's also there in you, whether there's two or three or not, if you're saved. He can't leave you. Okay. So, but if you get a group of Christians together and their purpose of getting together is to talk about God, buddy, there is a spirit there. There's power. And with that comes something. It sets a mood. And it should be peace. You know what they used to call a church? They used to call what you, you call nowadays an auditorium. It was not called an auditorium. It was called a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I like that. That is protection from all the outside. You know what they have for wildlife, because everybody loves to hunt them. They have wildlife sanctuaries where you can't come in and kill them. That's what a church used to always feel like. You walked in the church and, buddy, it was just relaxing and peaceful. Because you didn't have to worry about the world coming after you right then. Now, as soon as you step out the door, it changes. But <laughs> while you're in there, <laughs> look at Psalms chapter 23. Psalm 23, verse 6. This will give you peace if you actually believe it. David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It has so far, hasn't it? Look back on your life. That'd be the conclusion. Yeah, you've had some things that were, were not feeling like goodness happened to you. But by and large, it's been goodness, even as the world would consider it. And when we get to heaven, those things you thought weren't goodness, you'll see were engineered by God for your good. So it's true. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hmm. That's eternity. One day we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If that's your destiny, how come so many don't want to do it now? 
<laughs> they're not going to, <laughs> they're going to be shocked when they get to heaven and realize it's just like the thing that they ignored and refrained from going to while they were on earth. <laughs> Christians getting together. <laughs> Psalm chapter 92. Psalm 92, verse 13. Psalms 92, verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now, I hate to make this point, but I'm going to. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, you'll hear these people who are anti-church assembly. They say, a Christian is the church. And that's true. We are the body of Christ, whether you're in a building or not. However, we want to get together. Okay? If I cut my finger off and set it over there, that's part of my body. But don't I want that finger attached to my hand? It's a lot more useful <laughs> if I attach it to my hand. When we get the body together, it's better. <laughs> That's just simple. Uh, he says here, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Now, the Christians who are attempting to go to church, who are attempting to do right, by and large are the ones that are identified with a group of other Christians doing the same thing. Yeah, there may be one or two that aren't. There may be some hypocrites in that crowd. There's some hypocrites at Walmart, too. That doesn't keep anybody from going. <laughs> okay. So, if you want to flourish spiritually, go where sp spiritual people go to flourish. That's simple. Psalms 122. Psalms 122, verse 1. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, it should make you glad to go to church. It does me. I know I'm the preacher, but whether I was preaching or not, I would be glad to go. Now, if you can't be glad to go, maybe that's not the place you're supposed to be going. Maybe find a church where you're supposed to be fulfilling the verse and be glad to go there. It may be that the reason you're not glad to go there is because you're not living right. Yeah. We'll fix that because you won't be glad to go anywhere, any church, if you're not living right. You shouldn't be. Okay, so as a Christian, we should be glad to go to the house of the Lord. You should be glad to be able to get together with other Christians. Now, I'm going to make a difference here. There's coming a day where there won't, I don't know, maybe in America there will come a day before the rapture that you won't be able to meet in a church building. That's not how the body of Christ began. It began going house to house and little groups getting together. Well, that was the church. That was the little, they got together in a house and they had a regular scheduled meeting. Okay, everybody's gonna come over at this time. You look over at uh, the other countries who have outlawed Christianity. Well, they still do it. They try to get together. They had a prescribed time. There's something powerful about other Christians getting together with the purpose of learning and studying and sharing what God's shown them. Something powerful. That will, that will increase your spiritual growth like nothing else. And those who refrain from it stagnate real quick. And you can see it. Not only that, let's notice the place of peace. In jo uh, Joshua, Joshua 1, verse 9. First of all, the place of peace is obviously going to be in God's presence. I mean, he is the prince of peace. So, of course, you're going to find peace right where the prince of it is. <laughs> Joshua 1, verse 9. He says, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That's peace right there. If you knew. Now we know this in our head. 
A lot of times we forget it between our head and our heart and <laughs> whatever. But think about it. If you're saved, he's with you. He's right there. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, God's there with you. The same God of the Old Testament is your God, and he's with you wherever you are. Whatever you're facing, he is there. That'd give you some peace, wouldn't it? Peace of mind. Well, it's a fact whether you recognize it or not. <laughs> but when we recognize it, we get the emotional effect of peace. We've got it. We just don't realize it sometimes. Look at Psalm chapter 29. Psalm 29, verse 11. Y'all are glad now I didn't use anything out of the New Testament. We'd be another three hours. <laughs> Psalm 29, verse 11. It says, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Very clear. You get in his presence, you get his presence. <laughs> One of his gifts, a present, is his presence. And that is wrapped up in peace. The bow on it says peace. <laughs> That's what we get from it. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, 10. He says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Okay? If God's with you, there's no need to get scared. I know that's easier said than done. <laughs> but the next time you get scared, remember this. God's with me. There's no reason for me to get scared. He says, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, if you don't like righteousness, the rest of the verse isn't going to apply. But if righteousness is your goal, all the rest of that verse is for you. Right there. And that's a good one. That'll give you peace. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30, verse 10. Jeremiah 30, verse 10. He says, Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob. Sometimes you have to sit down and do that, but count all the times that the Bible says fear not. It's full of it. He knows we're a fearful people. <laughs> it's just natural for us to get scared about things. Well, you know what God's answer would be? Fear not. I got it. Trust in me. <laughs> he says, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar. Not from a fire, from afar. <laughs> That's the way a southerner says fire, afar. <laughs> and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet. None shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered you, thee, Yet will I not make a full end of thee, but will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Okay, just because God has to correct us every now and then and we recognize it as correction doesn't mean he's forsaken us. It means he's doing all the rest of it too. He's saving us. He's correcting us, but you only correct something you intend to keep. Okay, so he's saying right here, I'm going to save you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you peace. And there may come a time that you realize, hey, look, I stepped over the line there, and this is God's correction for me. But that's okay. Don't get mad at him. He says not to despise him. Don't despise him for correcting you. It means he's making you better. <laughs> not only that, we can see uh, peace in captivity. How many times did the children of Israel go into captivity? Over and over. You know the phrases he used? I'm not going to read all these verses because we'll be forever. But you know, you know how he would describe it? In Judges, he would say he delivered them to this nation. He delivered them into the hand of so-and-so. That was deliverance compared to what they would have done on their own. If he'd let them just do what they were heading for, they would have 
self-destructed in no time. So he delivered them to another nation that would correct them, but not destroy them altogether. That was God's deliverance. Even his correction is deliverance. How many times in the New Testament you find Paul talk about, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Okay? He was a prisoner. He was in captivity. But he said, Jesus Christ put me here. I'm doing his bidding. So even in captivity, we can be in the presence and have the peace of God. And uh, uh, go to one passage. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 7. He says, And seek the peace of the city, uh, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. I'm pulling this verse out because you find a lot of Christians who are doctrinally correct, and you couldn't say anything about their belief system negative that's wrong. But attitude is way wrong. They're like, you know, don't vote. All voting is wicked because the whole world system is wicked. And we know where it's heading and the Antichrist is going to come show up. And, you know, just, just let the world have the world. No, here, did you, th you think that God would have said that? No, he didn't. In fact, he told Israel... When I deliver you to a foreign country, you better be pe praying for that country's peace because that's how you'll get peace. You know how we're supposed to pray in the New Testament? We're supposed to pray for our rulers and for our uh, judges and kings and the principalities and all that stuff so that we can live a quiet and peaceful life. You're not going to have rest. If this government's in turmoil, you should be praying for it. He says here, even in captivity, they were directed to be praying for the peace of wicked people. Hmm. So that they would have peace. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword, uh, which were left of the sword, found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I caused him to rest. You know what? God wants us to rest. Sometimes physically. It's not good to not sleep. You know, your, God made your body, and he made your body to get tired and want to go take a nap. It starts healing itself when you're sleeping. <laughs> it's good for you. Your mind starts working again when you wake up. <laughs> if you just stay up, you know, hour after hour and never get a nap or take a rest, your mind quits working because your mind says, I need a rest. I'm going to take one whether you do or not. <laughs> God gave us rest on purpose. A lot of people never find rest because they don't honor the God who made that body. They may go to bed, but they don't rest. So you know what they do? They go down to the pharmacist and they say, give me some pills that'll make me rest. But it doesn't make them rest. It makes them sleep. But there's no rest. In that sleep, it's nothing but turmoil and trouble. When they wake up, they're not rested. That didn't do them any good. It's God who can give you rest. Not the pharmacist. Uh, not only that, we can find peace in suffering. I know that sounds harsh. But in the midst of suffering, you can find the peace of God if it's God-directed suffering. Now, if you're just suffering because you're stupid, then enjoy that too. But, uh, <laughs> but if God has directed the suffering, like with Job, that wasn't Job's fault that he was suffering. And God can still give you his presence and peace. In Psalms 119, look at verse 50. Psalms 119, verse 50. He says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. 
There it is right there. You want peace? You want comfort in the midst of affliction? It's found in one place, the Word of God. And if you won't go to the Word of God when you're in suffering and in affliction, and then don't count on getting the comfort and peace from it because that's where it's found. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 10, Ezekiel 37, 10. This is a passage about dead bones coming to life. <laughs> God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to these dead bones. And doctrinally, that's a picture of the nation of Israel coming back to life uh, after God turns back to them um, at the end of the tribulation. Ezekiel 37, verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Mm. How about that? Bones, dry bones. Sometimes your life might feel like dry bones. <laughs> you know what's going to bring it some life? Listening to what God has to say. That's the word that gave them life. That's the breath. God breathed this book. He brought it to life. If you'll get in that book, then your dry bones are going to come back to life. <laughs> That's good stuff. Not only that, you can have peace in poverty. Nobody wants that. The peace of poverty? <laughs> nobody, nobody wants the peace of poverty. But guess what? We can have it. Some people, I think, are ordained to be poor. And I really believe that. I believe some people God has ordained to be rich. It doesn't matter what they do. They sell toilet paper and they become a millionaire. <laughs> you know, I could come up with the greatest invention man's ever seen and never be able to sell the first one. <laughs> some people God's ordained to be rich and some to be poor. But poverty is no excuse for not having the peace of God. Matter of fact, it's more reason to have it. Psalms chapter 10, Psalms 10 verse 14. Psalms 10 verse 15. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. He says right there, a poor man should naturally commit himself to God. Now, a lot don't nowadays. We've gotten so far from things that should be natural for a man to do. But just by nature, a poor man should be counting on God. And he does. And if a poor man will count on God, he'll get all the gifts God gives. One of those gifts is peace. Look at Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 5. Psalm 12, verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Hmm. Look at that verse. God says, a poor man, I'm going to protect. If you're poor, that's a great thing to recognize. I'm a poor man. God, you promised to protect poor people. That's what he said. Not only that, Chapter 34, Psalm 34, verse 6. Psalm 34, verse 6. David said, This poor man cried, unto the, uh, cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of, what's that word? All his troubles. That'd be a good verse for everybody to claim, wouldn't it? You ever had trouble? How about a guarantee you won't have any? He said right there, saved him out of all his troubles. That's my life verse right there. <laughs> God does. Every trouble you've had in your lifetime has now been taken care of up to this point. You may have some that have not finished being taken care of yet. But everyone that threatened to doom you in your past has not done it. 
because you're still here. <laughs> so that's a fact. God does save you out of your troubles. Matter of fact, you can count on it. He's going to save you out of all of them. That's a good God. That's peace right there. Look at Proverbs chapter 17. Psalm 17 verse 1. He says, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Hmm. <laughs> that's, uh, that's this world. They've got things backwards. They give you a credit card so you can go out and buy all this junk and then sit there with all this junk, junk surrounding you and looking you in the face and now pay three times what that junk is worth. <laughs> That's not very comforting, is it? It would have been better if you had just bought one piece at a time that you paid for. And then when you looked at it, it was a blessing to you. Rather than haunting you. Hey, you still owe 35 times what this thing was worth. <laughs> That's America today. But hey, that's a fact. A dry morsel with quietness, that's much better, much more peaceful than a bunch of junk where there's strife, where there's tension. America needs to simplify. <laughs> Look at Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14 verse 29. He says, Rejoice not thou whole Palestina, Palestina because the rod of him that smote thee is broken for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent and the firstborn of the poor shall feed look at that all this bad stuff's going on around him and God says I'm taking care of the poor one the firstborn of the poor shall feed and the needy shall lie down in safety. And I will kill thy root with famine. And he shall slay thy remnant. Said, He's talking here to a country who's been persecuting Israel. And he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take care of business. And I'm going to destroy you. I've let you correct my people long enough. And now I'm coming after you. But he says, even amongst those heathen, the poor... I'm going to take care of. They're going to be able to eat. And they're going to be able to lie down in safety. Hmm. Pretty good benefit, isn't it? Being poor, if you trust God's worth it, peace comes with it. Uh, you can have peace in the midst of your enemies, but we don't have time to go through that. Let's run right to the last point so we can finish this up today. <laughs> the permission for peace. Permission for peace. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Therefore being justified by faith, we, present tense, have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only a Christian can have peace. Because only a Christian has the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so rest in peace, that little phrase, only applies to a living on this side of the earth, Christian. Because we have peace with God. Nobody else does. Peace with God's only found, according to our verse, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only people that find it, is those who find the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the world promises peace. They can promise it all day long, but they can't provide it because they don't own it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who's holding peace. Look at John chapter 14. John 14, verse 27. John 14, 27. This is Jesus talking here, and he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now the commandment part of it. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Those are the opposite of peace. 
and you're in control of which one wins. Jesus said, I left you peace. I've given it to you. You have it. Whether you use it or not, you have it. There's something that's more powerful than peace. It's you submitting to fear. And when you submit to fear, you no longer can see peace. So he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Stay away from trouble and fear. Don't let them control you. But rather, let peace that he's given you. You're not working for it. You're not trying to achieve it. If you're saved, you already have it. Just use it. Let's find it one other place. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 15. And this will be our last verse. We have gone long today. (laughs) Colossians 3 verse 15. He says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Now he said right there, you have to allow it. But the thing you can allow is this, the peace of God. And what's the peace of God supposed to be doing? It's supposed to be king, ruling in your heart. It makes the rules. Fear and trouble don't make the rules. Peace makes the rules. And if fear and trouble were going to enter and overpower your heart, you know the ruler, peace, would say, no, sir, you can't come in here. (laughs) So that biblically for a Christian is the way we're supposed to live. Now we'll cover the other two-thirds of our our verse another time. (laughs) But David said, I'm going to lay down in peace. He knew he had it and he was using it. We can too.